So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's James Owens. I'm the Managing Director for Edge House here in Asia Pacific. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we've got a very interesting session lined up today. Um, for those who weren't able, or colleagues who weren't able to make this session, the, this session will be recorded, the slides will be made available, and they will be sent through to you after the session. Um, so feel free to uh, share that with your peers and colleagues as, uh, as appropriate. Um, so today we've got uh, some very interesting speakers and we've got a lot of content to get through. So without further ado, let me introduce you to who's here on uh, the session today. Um, from the UK, uh, I know it's very early, uh, we have Steve Morell, um, who, who actually headed up this research and he represents Contact Babble. Uh, we'll, we'll find a lot of insights in regards to the Australian New Zealand market and some of the, the trends and effects which we're, we're actually seeing within market today. Um, and we actually have two customers, of Eng House customers joining us today. So Liz Gardner uh, from Wellways Australia and Janine Gibb from LIC in New Zealand. Um, we're going to hear a, a little bit more about um, uh, their respective organisations and their experiences. And over the course of this session, we will actually uh, run a couple of polls. Feel free to uh, interact with those polls. There's only two of them. Um, if you have any questions, we will be um, using the back end of this session to try and have a, a panel conversation. So feel free to load us up with questions along the way. Um, a lot of the statistics you'll see over the, the course of this session and some of the trends analysis um, we, we have a great panel here to discuss, uh, obviously, what we're seeing, what we're experiencing. Uh, I believe a lot of the trends which we'll talk about today, uh, a lot of you will also uh, be experiencing some of these areas, so you're not alone, which is the, the fantastic news. Um, so the great thing is, um, great, great, great uh, panel, real opportunity to ask the questions. We'll have a panel discussion at the end. So feel free to fire them along. Okay, so who's Eng House? Um, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time about us because I think the guys have got some real interesting topics to dive into. But for those of you who don't know us, we've been around an awful long time. We have a significant investment in the Australia and New Zealand contact centre industry. We've almost we've got roughly around 100 folks located between uh, Sydney, Melbourne, and Auckland. Um, so we, we, we have a significant presence within the region and have done for over 30 years. Um, that gives us an ability to really deal with the trends and, and the changes which are happening within the local market and be able to obviously um, pivot as and when required when local conditions obviously are more challenging than some other regions. So we are really looking and focusing and turning our attentions and, and providing solutions to what's actually happening within market and you'll see those investments as we go forward the great news is that we have invested heavily in recent years roughly about a quarter of our staff around 500 staff are involved in r d so we have that significant investment uh, portfolio in regards to dealing with some of the challenges, especially in the last two years around the pandemic. So we have a strength of brands, strength of history, and strength of capability to be able to meet some of the challenges which we'll be talking about over the course of today. So without further ado, let's move on to our um, first guest speaker and uh, representing LIC in New Zealand, we've got Liz, who uh, will take us through the next few slides. Over to you, Liz. Oh, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, LIC, <laughs> my bad, I've got it in the wrong way around. So Janine, sorry, Janine, could you uh, take us through uh, and uh, the next few slides, please? Sure. Um, so um, welcome and thanks for having me. Um, my name is Janine Gibb. Um, I'm in the National uh, Customer Experience Centre Manager for LIC. And LIC is a dairy genetics and software company um, that supports the New Zealand dairy industry. 
and we have a roughly 11,000 New, Ze New Zealand dairy customers. Um, we have other customers as well, but predominantly we're looking at the New Zealand dairy customers. Um, and our focus for us um, in our centre is around the education and support um, of our proprietary software and capturing any technology enhancements that we can from um, our, our customers on how they want that to operate for them better to be able to get better results on farm. Um, so, yep, I can go to the next slide. Um, so our hours, are, as it says there, we're doing um, Monday to Friday operation, 14 hours a day. That has been changed um, just recently, but I can talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the effects of the pandemic. Um, it's a, a lot of challenges, obviously, that everybody is facing around staffing and the technology, um, in-house software um, and CRMs, and also trying to meet the customer expectations. So that's a little bit about us. So thank, thanks for that. Sorry for the wrong introductions, my fault. Uh, so from Wellways, um, we've got Liz joining us. Over to you, Liz. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so I'm Liz Gardner. I'm currently the Acting National Manager for Care Gateway Contact Centre. Um, so a little bit about Wellways. Um, Wellways Australia is a leading not-for-profit provider um, specialising in mental health, disability, youth and carer services. Um, and we work really intensively with individuals, but then also families, communities, um, to really drive the work in, in um, you know, improving people's lives, but also making sure that the communities that they live in are, are safe and accessible as well. Um, we have offices throughout Queensland, New South Wales, uh, Australian Capital Territory, Victoria and Tasmania as well. Uh, so our contact centre, um, so Care Gateway Services commenced um, as of the 6th of April 2020 um, and we have um, all of the service area which involves the state of Queensland and then a small pocket of New South Wales which involves um, South West Sydney and the Namahian Blue Mountain region. Um, but we have two contact centres, so one that is based in Brisbane in Upper Mount Gravatt in Queensland and another in Campbelltown in New South Wales. Uh, we operate 24-7 um, with three uh, shifts per day with, uh, at this stage, uh, 85 staff, not including our casuals. Um, and yes, so we have 280 inbound um, calls and 190 outbound calls per day um, for a standard weekday. Um, and last financial year, I can say that we, um, we tallied uh, over 51,000 calls all up. So. Nice and exciting uh, volumes that we're talking. Um, so I guess a little bit more historically about Wellways. So Wellways traditionally delivers um, all of our services in person, being the nature of mental health, disability and community supports. Um, for specifically Care Gateway, there was a sector reform um, which required the um, innovation of actually delivering services via phone, um, which of course, um, you know, came about the, the need to develop the contact centre um, in, in the ability to, to be able to deliver a blended service model. Um, from our contact centres, uh, we deliver the intake and registration process for the program, as well as uh, assessment, planning and review, um, which is part of that process includes referrals and financial packaging services. Uh, but we also provide emergency and crisis support as part of the Care Gateway service. Uh, so some of the challenges, um, which I know won't be necessarily unique to us, um, will be moving to a work from home model. Um, so for New South Wales at the moment, we're currently in our week 13 of lockdown. Um, and at, throughout the points of the last sort of 12 to 18 months, we've had 100% um, of our contact centres working off site for uh, extended periods of time. Um, the impacts of the pandemic, so we being in the, the community services and mental health sector, we haven't necessarily seen a drop. Uh, if anything, we've actually seen an increase in demand for supports. Um, and that's been a, a huge driver in ensuring that we actually are able to meet the service delivery demands um, in the nature of the work. 
Uh, agent engagement and attrition rates is something that we have um, challenged with. And I think this is really coming out about the fact that we've gone from what has traditionally been a face-to-face -face interaction service to, as we said, the, the blended service delivery model. So moving a lot of that to phone and digital um, to service platforms, which has been an interesting um, transition over the past 18 months. Um, the other aspect is the, the broad demographics of our range of service users so um, and, and very much engaging with diverse communities um, in the contact centre service delivery. So we've actually employed as part of that um, multiple bilingual workers to be able to cater for a range of different non-English speaking backgrounds, for example. So um, th thanks guys, um, we'll, we will obviously be asking you some of your opinions and questions as we go through the rest of the analysis as we're going into that part of the presentation. Um, so joining us from the UK, I think it's roughly about 10 past five in the morning. Uh, we have Steve joining us who, um, thank you for getting up so early in the morning for us. And obviously Steve's been working uh, with local associations. I'll let him go through a little bit more detail, obviously, how this research was pulled together and who he worked with. So, Steve, I'll pass over to yourself. Okay, thanks, James. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so before we start the presentation, I'd just like to say um, a big thanks to our research partners that you can see here who helped us with uh, the research for this report. And indeed, anybody on the call who took the survey, it really is much appreciated. So, um, Hi, thanks for attending the webinar. Um, and this looks at the results of Contact Babel's latest piece of research, which is our first look into the Australian and New Zealand contact centre industry. So there's a lot to get through today. So let's look first at the research basis from which this report is written. So um, Australian contact centres provided 59 surveys with New Zealand contributing 44. The private sector answered 59 surveys and the public sector non-profits um, again accounted for 44 and you see the split there um, it's roughly what we believe to be um, in terms of size probably quite uh, equivalent to the the Australian New Zealand market there so weighted somewhat towards sub 50 seats but you know with a fair smattering of the larger ones here as well and as we might expect weighted towards the inbound and service sectors so the presentation is broken up into six pieces and the first one will look at the effects of the pandemic on contact centres and customer experience and I'll just say won't it be great when we don't have to worry about this anymore. So this chart uh, shows the proportion of contact centres across not only Australia and New Zealand but also the US and UK which is um, the, the geographies that we've been studying for the past 20 years. So we know quite a lot about those. So I thought it might be interesting in, in the presentation and also in the report to kind of throw those in almost like as a benchmark of mature industries, just to see how Australia and New Zealand is stacking up against them. So this looks at how the customer experience has been affected. And the first thing really to say here is that these figures could differ greatly um, depending on exactly when a contact centre answered the survey. So for example, if it's in the depths of a hard lockdown or in a more relaxed period. But having said that, around a third of respondents from Australia and New Zealand said that the customer experience was not much affected by the pandemic at all. However, 28% of Australian respondents uh, said that things were still not back to normal for their contact centres. Um, I say that may well kind of change almost by the day. Looking in depth um, about what these problems are, um, we can see that it's not the case that it's only one or two problems that are still with these contact centres. The most frequently cited issues are higher than usual contact volumes, along with insufficient headcount, which kind of go together. But many also say that things like staff attrition, uh, reduced operating budget, and also, you know, difficulties in re managing remote teams, there's still major problems for many. Uh, good to see that kind of work from home technology is generally speaking much less of an issue. Um, Janine, would you like to comment on this? Sure, thanks Steve. Um, that, so it's, it's our first pandemic um, and it is for everybody. So for us particularly, we're learning all the time around our people and the technology that we've got available and what else we need to be able to support that. 
Um, customer experience has um, has different expectations in a pandemic, and f and for us, um, while we've been in lockdown, our, our farmers were exceptionally patient with us um, and very supportive of um, what service they did get. Um, so for us, um, it, it's been spending a bit of time around how much flex we have or don't have, and um, a little bit of healthy tension at times to be able to support our customers via other channels, i.e. self-service. Um, it also about pivoting what, what technology we've got available and how we are going to use it. And sometimes we're stretching that technology um, beyond its, um, its probably its initial um, use or what we expected to use it for. Um, the, our centre, um, our, our customer activity increased uh, in 20, um, in 2020 and 21, um, but we had a massive reduction in staff numbers, caused, which caused us to have a, a lot of um, increase due to the longer wait times. And we'd been on track to have um, those wait times being reducing and to be able to have a really good, healthy service levels, but um, we lost a lot of that, that, that traction. Um, we did lose uh, a lot of our new recruits that started. Um, we lost 80% within three months, largely um, due to um, the at home or work from home. Um, our environment requires us to have quite a, a lengthy support process um, due to the complexity and the seasonality of farming. Um, and we did lose a lot of them because working from home was very challenging and it wasn't what necessarily what they'd signed up for. A lot of our staff um, live in shared accommodation and it's not set up so, and they hadn't been employed for work from home. So we did lose a lot of that and they didn't get a lot of the um, collegial support and peer-to-peer -peer learning and growth and development that you would get when you're actually um, back together. So we've had to do a lot of pivoting um, and applying really co good common sense to a lot of the problems. Um, so we've gone on with this um, particular lockdown that New Zealand's been experiencing. We've reduced our hours because we didn't have the staff to cover for the full 14 hours. Um, and surprisingly, our farmers have been very, very tolerant of that. Uh, but we've also spent and upped the um, expectation around education for our farmers to use the self-service um, tools that are actually available. Um, and that has actually been working relatively well. We've got a long way to go. Um, so we're crossing fingers that, we're, that we'll be able to get um, a better result as, as the time goes on. And hopefully we don't have any more severe lockdowns like we do. Noticeable um, increase in um, demand on staff. Um, and for us, um, the introduction, which we hadn't done in the past, was a um, an addition to our teams, which was seasonal staff because of the the, the training um, component of our business. Um, we've actually taken that as a bit of a trial. Um, it's working exceptionally well for us um, and just breaking down little um, tasks and activities so they can grab some of the um, email type or administrative type functions and um, work on that and then um, be trained um, online um, as we go through. So getting all our agents working from home, a real challenge, um, lots of um, issues around internet connection and tools that we have available. Um, so those have all been things that we've been having to work on, but um, we're really grateful to all of our suppliers that have been working with us to help us get there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Janine. Uh, Liz, do you have anything to add here? Um, I think for us, we found that we did have a, a dramatic increase, um, particularly around the emergency and crisis support offerings um, of our service. So we actually saw a 300% increase um, after the fourth week of lockdown in New South Wales, um, just for emergency respite requests. So um, as a result, we did have to sort of really think on our feet, you know, utilise our casual talent pool and, and really reinforce just to meet the service demand in that regard. So it was something that you know, because we'd have these sort of quick snap lockdowns previously, we utilised that sort of experience to say, okay, how do we respond very quickly um, to ensure that there's there's no issue in, in service delivery. So it, it was something that this time round, we've been able to, to work much more effectively. Um, and I think as, as this particular lockdown has gone on um, for a much longer period of time, the work from home arrangement has worked reasonably well um, and we're finding that a lot of the sort of the, the customers that are and the clients that are ringing the service um, are really forgiving in the fact that you know there's always going to be a child screaming in the background or a dog barking and, and the like so it's something that they have been really forgiving um, as well so it's been it's been a nice sort of combination but we have absolutely seen a, an increase and it, it just comes down to the nature of the fact that we're we're providing a, a service um, for at risk so it, it's certainly certainly reflected in the numbers that we're seeing. Okay that's great thanks I think it's probably worth um, from a UK perspective here because you know, we've, we've been in lockdown for 
um, a long time, just come out of it relatively recently. Um, the customer tolerance, I, I'll say, is a finite um, resource. That's that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to go into any more detail. Um, so, right, uh, let's ne look next at remote working, um, something which we've all become extremely familiar with. So this is, um, let's see, what we've got here is around 15% um, of US contact centers were based at home before the pandemic, um, a figure which is now 86%. The UK figure, um, which is now um, almost 80%, was only 5% before um, this pandemic hit. So it's seen massive ramping up in here. And although this isn't um, something that's necessarily covered um, within this presentation, it's worth noting that people's expectations for the future are very much um, not about returning to a centralized contact center structure. It's very much along hybrid lines. Um, so that's be worth, worth um, you know, talking about later, perhaps, or considering. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, these figures are somewhat lower. Um, but it's very noticeable that there's an expectation in your countries that some form of remote working, um, full-time or hybrid that wasn't investigated here, will continue for the foreseeable future. So it's not the case we're all going to get back to, quote, normal, um, because some stuff about remote working can work well for agents and also businesses. So moving on to um, the HR side of things, we'll look at attrition, absence, and always of interest, salaries. The first um, attrition, uh, reported mean att agent attrition rates in Australia and New Zealand are currently 18% compared to 20% in the UK and 30% in the US. Although the latter's figures often include large numbers of outsourcers, which are much more likely to have very high attrition rates, which kind of drags up the mean average, which is why we've shown some median stuff there as well. Looking at attrition rates um, by organizational type, so private or public sector nonprofit, we can see that uh, commercial businesses uh, will tend to report attrition rates of double or even more that found in the public sector. And this is pretty typical in the US and UK as well. I mentioned the outsourcing sector just before. So we took these respondents out of the data just to see you know, how much of an effect they were having on this and looked again at the commercial sector. In Australia, the attrition rate then dropped about 17% for the private sector, whereas New Zealand's figures remain the same. And as with our studies in the US and UK, larger contact centers do tend to have uh, significantly higher agent attrition rates in general. Uh, Janine, do you have any observations about agent attrition? Yes, um, it's probably the year 2020 and 2021 have definitely been the highest years of attrition that I've seen since I've been in, in the role that I'm in, which is I've been here for 13 years, which is a long time. Um, it's it, it has been very tricky. Um, I don't predict it's going to get any better. Um, it's, recruitment is a real challenge. Um, there's been a noticeable reduction of applicants, um, up to 70% reduction. Um, and there are a lot of organisations that are wanting the skills that um, good CERs can provide and good contact centres that train their staff well. So you will find that you'll almost have your, your centre targeted in some respect if you've got a reputation for uh, training well or, or, or hiring and, and recruiting really good people. Um, so we've noticed a, a very aggressive um, market out there, of, which we've been slow to pick up on, but um, we've, we've had to take um, some risks. Um, it does mean that for us that we've been taking um, people with probably slightly less experience and um, skills than what we would have done in the past, which means that we're then having to invest more time into training and support um, and our training is typically around about 12 months. So, but we're still losing people. Um, to be realistic, probably about one in four um, are, are staying longer than 12 months at this point. So it is high. Wow. Yeah. It is. Um, Liz, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, for I guess our specific sector, it, it sits a little bit different. Like the one thing that we noted was that because this typically was delivered in a face-to-face -face model, it wasn't phone-based interactions. We had a lot of people that joined our contact centre without any contact centre experience. So we haven't necessarily seen the the large attrition issues. Um, it, it's still there. I'm not, I'm not going to say that it, it doesn't exist, but 
um, we've certainly looked at it a lot more sort of as, you know, what are the transferable skills and, and particularly um, around, as I said, the, those crisis supports, um, you know, we, we can teach people the systems, we can teach people, um, you know, the, the, the standard and the quality of the service that we expect, but it's really the, the skill in working in, um, you know, the community sector and, and mental health specifically that we, we value much higher and, and being able to sit there and go, yep, we've got that. We can, we can certainly see that we're, we're hitting the, the bar or the standard that we need to in that regard. Here is now the systems and the processes to be able to function within this um, specific examples. So we found it worked a little bit better in that regard because we've um, attracted applicants and candidates to roles that otherwise probably would not have applied for contact centre roles. Um, and it's it's meant that we've got a really nice blend of, of staff within our centres that have not only come from contact centre um, backgrounds for the past, you know, 10 10 years or so, but we also have, you know, for example, case managers that have been in mental health for the last 30 years that are that are working really comfortably together and utilising the experience and skill sets for both respective parts of the organisation. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to absence rates. Um, so this means in this particular um, scenario short-term absence rates are defined as any days lost through short-term sickness and unauthorized absence or no shows rather than the things that can be planned for like maternity leave sabbaticals long-term sick etc uh, you can see that in both australia and new zealand there are over 40 percent of contact centers reporting very high absence rates of over 10 percent and this filters through into the mean average which is 9.2 in australia and 8.3 in new zealand um, it's also noticeable um, that's the, the the median, so the midpoint, if you like, the typical, is higher in both of these territories compared to the UK and the US. So I'll go to um, Liz. Liz, um, can I ask, are there any comments on the kind of changes in agent absence rates that you've seen personally? Um, I think for our centre, it, it's it's been interesting. Since we've implemented work from home, we've actually seen a drop in age and absence. And I think it's very much just the fact that people are, if they're feeling a little bit poorly, they're still happy to, you know, work because they're working from home. So it's certainly something that we're looking at a lot more flexibly moving forward. Um, but also in how we manage that once we do get to a stage where we can, you know, for the most part, we can have staff returning to offices. It, it's it's really shown us how we can utilise um, our ca casual talent pool in, you know, backfilling those vacant spots, regardless of whether it's just for a couple of hours or a day here and there. So we can be really flexible to meet the the service demands, um, you know, as as it's happening, as opposed to to just being, you know, not ha you know seeing that the increase in calls and then not having the the staff to be able to back that up um, when it's actually happening. So. Um, but the work from home arrangement, it, it's certainly been, you know, out of necessity, absolutely, but it's been received quite well for the teams um, and, and the feedback certainly, you know, mirrors that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Janine, do you have anything to add about absence rates? Um, yes, yeah, slight increase for, for us, um, from a, probably from a, um, a mental health and wellbeing concern. Um, so we've noticed, obviously, um, like Liz, that in a work from home environment that you tend to have less um, unplanned absences, which you would expect because people will sort of just get on with it maybe, you know, and do a bit slower. Um, but when we've been back in the office, for us, it's um, probably been more noticeable around the, um, just, a, just a heightened sort of sense of anxiety, particularly if there's a, a local outbreak or an event that somebody has or people have attended. Um, so there's a lot of COVID testing, which is obviously some of the stand down days. So those sorts of things are unplanned and unexpected. So um, definitely a slight increase, but there's also been an incredible amount of people actually stepping up and making themselves more available and taking on um, a little bit extra and looking at their own um, heightened health precautions um, as well. So it's been it, it's it's been really quite noticeable about you know who who's who's on the bus and who's not on the bus. So it does hurt when you've got a smaller team though when you have um, unplanned. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, right, looking now at salaries, there's a lot of figures here. So rather than go through each one individually, I'll just comment briefly on this. Uh, within the report itself, salaries are also broken down by contact centre size and organisational type. So you might want to look through that at your own leisure. 
Uh, these charts here show average salaries for four job roles in the contact center. So new agents, experienced agents, team leaders, supervisors, and also contact center managers. On the left hand side, we've got salaries in Australian dollars, and on the right, it's in New Zealand dollars. It's noticeable that our Australian survey respondents in blue, um, they pay considerably more on average at all levels than New Zealand, the US or the UK. Uh, the New Zealand figures, so those in black, are very similar to the US, and the UK pays the least of the four countries on average. So moving on to operational benchmarking, we'll look at several key metrics, um, including call duration, call abandonment, speed to answer, first contact resolution, and cost per interaction. But before we do that, uh, we'll go to our first poll. Um, so our first question is, which is the most important operational performance metric for your contact center? Um, then it may not well be included here. So in that case, please just kind of pick the, pick the one that's closest. So the options are average speed to answer, first contact resolution rate, call abandonment rate, cost per interaction, or service level adherence or a similar type of measure. So we'll give you a moment to decide, then look at the results. So um, just jump in at this moment, and it's really interesting to see um, first contact resolution, which is regardless pre post pandemic, I think has been around for an awful long time as one of the primary motivators within the industry rates still very highly, um, especially that um, if you look at both regions are un under some sort of duress around lockdowns and things like that. That the expectation is still high. Um, guys, anything from your point of view, what you're seeing as well? Is this pretty much representative as well, what you're seeing? Uh, personally, I can't comment because I can't see the poll results. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, perhaps I should. So, uh... was it, so it's first contact resolution, was that the one that's winning? Yeah, so uh, first contact resolution, an outstanding. Um, skew with 57 percent yeah and then that, you've got the average bounce around the 17 call abandonment rate and service level adherence equal on 13. but well, cost per interaction interestingly enough didn't feature that's that's interesting and also very reassuring um what we found in our research over many many years is that the metric with the greatest impact on customer experience is indeed first contact resolution um, it's something that works well for the business in terms of cost um, and it's something that obviously works well for customers as well so as i say that is quite reassuring okay so um, let's look at some performance metrics in more depth hopefully you're looking at a screen that says mean call duration on it um, We'll start with that because most contact centers still measure this despite its importance having faded considerably since we first tracking these metrics in the UK back in 2001. The feeling now is often that a call should take as long as it takes in order to get the best outcome. However, you know, call duration is still a good indicator of call costs and at an individual level it can be useful to look at in order to understand whether an agent uh, personally is coping effectively with the work. Um, <laughs> Being a bit cynical, it's also you know something that's easy to measure accurately, unlike some other metrics. So even though it's possibly not the, the, key, the key metric anymore, kind of everybody still knows about call duration. So this chart here, what we have on the left-hand side is the average length of service calls, and on the right, sales calls. Uh, service calls in Australia and New Zealand are considerably shorter than those in the US and UK. Um, as we've been tracking the US and UK for a long time, it's interesting to note there that Every year, the length of service calls gradually increases. And we believe this is because as easier calls are being handled through self-service and digital channels, those that are now left for the telephony channel tend to be more complex and can take longer as a result. Now, as we don't have any historical information from Australia and New Zealand yet, I don't know whether this is the case here as well, but I would expect it to be so. Sales calls as a rule will tend to take longer than service calls because they may require things like payment information to be taken 
and there's often compliance and legal statements to be read out too as you know as well as you know the cheeky cross sell and upsell so looking at um, call abandonment rates now um, call abandonment um, impacts on a lot of other areas as well such as things like speed to answer revenue customer satisfaction we've shown the mean, the mean and the median here and we can see that the relatively small number of New Zealand respondents reporting a very high call abandonment rate has kind of dragged up the mean considerably. And the median is a little higher than in the other territories studied. Looking at speed to answer, this is a key metric um, that concerns a customer experience. And you know, in our research, we've seen it again and again that customers see this as being far more important than the actual length of the call. Speed to answer in US and UK has pretty much doubled over the course of the pandemic. Again, you know, we don't have historical Australia and New Zealand figures yet to compare this to. And although the median is considerably lower, showing that there's a relatively small number of contact centres with very high average speed to answer, the typical median um, in, in US, UK back in the good old days was around 20 seconds rather than 35 seconds. So we can state, you know, fairly clearly that. Um, speed to answer is increasing. So moving on to first contact resolution rates. This is something that many contact centres either don't measure or can only roughly estimate, which is a real shame as we believe this is one of the absolute key metrics impacting on customer experience. As I said, um, a lot of the surveys in the past, you know, basically show very clearly that customers believe having their issues answered correctly first time is the most important thing that a contact center or the business can do for them. First contact resolution also has a positive effect on agent morale and directly impacts on the overall cost of the operation. So it's really, you know, it's a win-win metric for everyone. It should be noted though, um, high first contact resolution rates aren't necessarily beneficial in themselves. So for example, you know, if a successful self-service solution is brought in and implemented, a lot of the easier work can then be handled through that which means that the complexity and solvability of the remaining work on the telephony channel will change and first contact resolution rates can actually decrease. So that's kind of something to bear in mind. It's a tricky metric, although it's really important. Uh, Liz, do you have any comments on first contact resolution? Yeah, I think um, 100% we've found exactly the same thing in the fact that, you know, if you look at the first contact resolution rate in isolation, it doesn't, you don't get a, a, a solid capture of the data that you're wanting to actually analyze um, to be able to look at the the customer experience from start to finish um, in saying that though it's it's something that you know looking from the customer experience of how they're engaging with us has it been easy to get in contact with us all of that sort of thing then and and obviously the nature of what happens once that phone is answered um, absolutely plays a, a key part of it so part of being able to support that though is really the the vital importance of making sure that the agents are cross-trained um, and also that they've got enough um, of the sort of I guess relevant authority to be able to action the calls just to make sure that you know we're making sure that we don't have to have multiple agents handling issues and and really adhere to that um, you know FCR rate as much as we can. Thank you. Um, Janine do you have anything to add? Um, so we don't tend to measure first call resolution and that's not something that we haven't tried to do in the past. It's just that it's been very challenging for us to actually get um, a, a good a good understanding of what it would mean in our business. Our farmers um, will obviously have multiple activities in a day that they will decide they need to call us on. So um, and they can be escalated to different departments for different reasons because of different expertise given the genetics and the, um, the, the, the different types of products that different, need different types of support, um, which would be impossible for our, our guys to be able to be cross-trained across all of that. So um, we have you know, roughly between 10 and 11 minutes um, talk time. We don't measure our talk time other than we measure it, but we don't have any targets on it. Um, but there's a very strong dependency. So first call resolution for us is something that we we look at and but we don't we don't focus on that as being as being a priority for us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense in that case. Okay, um, this chart shows the cost in Australian dollars for various channels, telephony, email, web chat, and social media across four countries. It's probably another chart to consider at your leisure, but there's a couple of things worth talking about here immediately. 
So we see that Australia has the highest cost for a phone call, email and web chat, which is almost certainly connected to the fact that Australian contact centres in our survey pay the highest salaries. And also you know, another thing to note, it's only the UK that's managing to currently exhibit any major cost differential between telephony and digital channels. And even in this case, the cost of handling emails is still quite high. And this chart shows the same information, but in New Zealand dollars. And I'll just give you a moment to look through that. Well, you know, you will be sent this presentation after the webinar, so you don't have to scribble down lots of numbers. So let's look at the um, moving on contact centre technology being used now. And first, we'll look at Australia. Um, so we have a load of technologies there ranked. The, the ones that are being used mainly at the moment are in the green and towards the bottom. The ones that are more new are towards the top. So the dark green shows they don't have any plans to upgrade or change. And the light green shows that they are looking to upgrade or change it. Those in yellow or orange intend to implement this technology either within, within 12 months or, or later in case of the darker colour. Those in red don't have any intention to do so yet. As you'd expect, traditional contact centre technology such as call recording is in place in most Australian operations along with email management, touchstone IVR and workforce management. And the data on the right hand side is where we've picked out a few comparisons with the UK and US. So, for example, in the UK, web chat is at 57 percent, whereas in Australia, it's 38 percent. And again, this is something to look at properly when the clock's not against us. Looking at New Zealand, fairly similar pattern, call recording, email management, IVR amongst those widest used. It's noticeable that both in Australia and New Zealand, the proportion of contact centres using interaction analytics is very considerably lower than it is in the US and UK. And this might well be because the average size of the contact centres is very different across all of these territories. So with those having the largest and thus the most data to play with and to analyse, have usually been the first to implement this sort of technology, although we are seeing it um, impact into smaller contact centres now. So let's go to the polls again. Um, the second question is, what new contact centre technology have you adopted to manage or improve your customer service in response to the pandemic? The options are an additional contact channel, chatbot or AI, agent monitoring real-time dashboards, another type of technology or no technology update. And again, we'll give you a minute to decide and hopefully James can put me in the picture about what the results are. So we're almost getting there. Most people have started to vote. But look, there is a, a trend coming through here. Um, the vast majority, um, especially throughout the pandemic, just over 54% um, selected no technology update. Now, there are one or two real interesting questions about this, which we'll park till later. But um, what was interesting, that an additional uh, contact channel was roughly about 13%. Uh, chatbot and AI, which we saw there's a lot of consideration around that area, around 21% uh, of the respondees said that they look to obviously leverage those channels and that capability more so. Um, and really between agent monitoring and the others was roughly about 10% split. But yep. in reality, the vast majority of contact centres struggled through. Yep. Yeah, um, just for interest in the UK, um, there's real major interest in chatbots and kind of using some sort of intelligence behind that as well. That was kind of something that we, we saw a lot of. OK, um, look now at channels in a bit more depth. So same four countries, um, we can see that Australian survey respondents report that more than three quarters of their inbound activity is through telephony at the moment and that compares to just over 60 percent in new zealand amongst our respondents and around 65 percent or so in the uk and us our new zealand respondents are also much higher users of email but the other digital channels like social media and web chat um, they tend to be lower in australia and new zealand than they are in the us and uk and janine do you have any thoughts on this um, yes, yeah, so for, for us, phone is, is definitely still our highest um, volumes. Our, our email side of things is increasing as a percentage, and we and we do um, 150,000 contacts um, via phone and email per year. 
um, so the, the, there definitely is an increase in activity across those main those main queues of ours as well. But we we we're also competition. Our centre is actually in competition with itself um, around its software. So our farmers do tend to want to talk to us by a phone versus using other channels, which we have web chat as well, which they tend to use very, very rarely. Um, they tend to want to talk it through and have somebody um, talk them talk them through the issue or talk them through the education rather than um, emailing it because it, they might as well have just done it themselves if they were going to email. So, there's, But it is an increase for us around the email channels. Thank you. Uh, Liz, um, what changes in channel volumes have you experienced? Um, we have seen an increase in the emails, um, but yeah, the, the, the standout is that phone-based live agent interaction. Um, and I think that just falls in line with the, the indiv individualised tailored support uh, that we offer. Yeah. Okay, super, thank you. So we asked our survey respondents what the most effective channel would be for the customers to use in case of service sales and complaints. Uh, there's not a huge amount of difference between Australia and New Zealand. There's, there's a feeling um, that telephony is best in most cases, especially for service and complaints. And I will say that's also a kind of strengthening that we've seen in the other territories we cover too. Um, although I will say the UK and US, because they're maybe a bit further down the digital channels than um, Australia and New Zealand, more of the businesses there are likely to recommend the web chat for service and also email is seen as being a good channel to use for complaints just as it is in New Zealand. Um, Liz, do you have any opinion on the best channel for your customers to use? I imagine what, what you said there is possibly telephony. Yeah, definitely telephony. We found um, because we're able to have that interaction live, um, we've actually prevented a lot of things from obviously escalating because we have that, you know, first contact resolution in place. So um, it's certainly looking at how the channels actually operate in that regard. Um, it, it saves a lot of time um, in, you know, being proactive in those interactions and, and preventing things and de-escalating um, instead of seeing it obviously, you know, escalate from there and then becoming a, a larger concern if it was to go down that path, yeah. Janine, do you have a view on this? It would be phones. Um, I guess our agents um, would prefer it was emails, um, but for for us, it's it's definitely uh, it's something that our customers do prefer being able to talk with us. Particularly if they've got a lot to um, get off their chest or say or advise us about. So. Uh, <laughs> Phones is what our customers like. Um, we prefer the emails because it's a little bit more exact. Although you can get a lot of toing and froing, which means you end up with a, a an actual, you know, quite a lot of um, waste of time and what have you. And it does slow things down a little bit. Um, but during a pandemic, the 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 email is definitely noticeably increasing. Thank you. Okay, so if we want customers to use channels other than telephony, the effort, experience and outcome needs to be at least as good. Uh, these next couple of charts look at the service levels that are coming through digital channels. This particular chart, chart shows how quickly emails are being handled and we can see that around 40% of emails in Australia, New Zealand and the UK are taking at least a day to handle compared to only 17% in the US. Now, taking longer than a day to answer an email does run the risk that the customer may lose patience and either go elsewhere or decide to phone the contact centre, meaning that the business now has two queries to answer. So looking at web chat wait times, um, chart looks at Australia and New Zealand, um, what the customer's experience for web chat on the right hand side here, that's on the left hand side, on the right hand side we consider uh, web chat durations. Uh, the majority of New Zealand respondents um, report, re report that it takes less than a minute to start a chat, whereas this is only the case for 11% of Australian businesses. Uh, this figure in the UK is 87% and in the US is 85%. Now, this may be an anomaly, um, but you know, worth keeping an eye on if we do this in future years. Um, looking at the length of web chats, New Zealand reports that 40% take less than three minutes compared to only 2% in Australia. And the UK, this is 54% and the US, 48%. Um, we found looking at these countries that web chat durations are actually going up just as is happening in the voice channel because we believe that web chats are actually becoming more complex now. 
again, kind of driven by self-service, soaking up the simplest, que <clears throat> simplest queries, excuse me. Briefly considering social media response times, the large majority are answered within the same day and around half take under two hours, which is very positive indeed. And finally, we've got a couple of slides looking at actual and expected headcount growth rates in Australia and New Zealand. Now this first chart looks at Australia, so it's a little bit complex, so bear with me. The height of each column shows whether the contact centres shrank, remained the same or grew over the past 12 months. And as we can see, pretty much the same proportions shrank that did grow. The colours in the chart here show the expectations over the next 12 months, with green showing expected growth, yellow remaining the same, and red expecting a shrinkage. There seems to be an expectation that the majority of Australian contact centres will grow in the next 12 months. And when we consider our survey respondents' actual headcount figures, there was a combined fall in headcount of 11% last year, which was quite a drop, but this is expected to be followed by a 17% increase in the next year. Looking at New Zealand, the pattern is fairly familiar, uh, similar even. Um, same number of respondents growing and shrinking last year, although there is somewhat less expectation of growth in the next 12 months. Our survey respondents saw um, a 3% growth overall last year and expect 4% next year, so pretty steady in New Zealand. So that completes our presentation of the um, 2021 Australia New Zealand Contact Centre Industry Report. I hope you found something interesting and useful there. Um, I'll hand back now to James from Ench House, and then I believe we'll be taking some questions. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, guys, for your time today. Um, obviously, uh, we've got a couple of questions already coming through. Feel free to add them more. I'll try and get to them where possible. Um, just the easy one um, I can handle uh, right at the top. Will the webinar be available uh, after this presentation? Absolutely. Um, you'll uh, you'll see a link in your inbox in the coming hours or a day or so afterwards. Feel free to share that and this will be made available. The report itself is also available and there will be instructions obviously to download that and peruse at your pleasure. Um, there is a good question here, which um, I know uh, when we were talking about moving to home, uh, working from home. Um, guys, I'm just wondering, you, when when you obviously had to move to, uh, to a work from home model, uh, did you provide the technology to the employees or was it a BYO um, uh, arrangement? So what, what, what technical aspects did you equip them with and did you pro provide any technology so that they could provide their capabilities from home? Liz? Uh, so we provide, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Liz. <laughs> Go on, Jimmy. Um, so uh, we, we provided everything um, and then a, an on help, uh, an on hand help desk as well to take um, each of our teams through any um, technical supports that they may have been getting. So um, everything was provided for our guys. So look, yeah. there is a separate part to this question. There's a part B. Uh, what sort of issues did you encounter and uh, how did you go about supporting them? Connectivity was one of the key ones for us um, right. and, and set up. So, I mean, obviously, um, you've still got to take in, so you've got a, a workspace environment, you've still got to take into account um, the, the well-being of, of your people at home. Are they actually in an environment that's right? Um, is it safe? Is it secure? because um, the data that you know that we have um, does have commercial value so it, we have to ensure that all of that is set up um, as well as the technology um, needs that you've got but predominantly it was it was connectivity um, for us and it varied from person to person right <laughs> Thanks. Um, so next question I've got here is um, uh, what do you see as the main drivers for moving uh, to a more digital omni-channel contact centre? You want to okay. that? Can I can I have a first stab at that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd say there's probably a few issues. Um, number one is customer demand, um, and yeah, it, it's 
the demand for 24 7 service or possibly you know not 24 7 but you know extended service hours without having to um throw huge amounts of um human resource at this um obviously reduction in cost to serve coming from that and i think it's really important um customer requirements for a mix of synchronous and asynchronous um requests so you know sometimes people don't want to be sometimes people need a really really urgent um inquiry so they're happy to wait on the phone other times they'd rather just fire and forget and that's where email comes in um or you know we're increasing now we're seeing messaging through the likes of whatsapp as well that's growing rapidly um so if they're happy to just wait for an answer then that works for them if they and we need also need some channels where if they want an immediate answer that's that's available for them so that's what i would say Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Um, actually, this is probably just a, a prompted uh, from the earlier question about work from home. How did you manage the OHS perspectives uh, for the work from home workstations? Um, obviously, for for the rest of uh, the audience here, you know, most organisations well, organisations still have a responsibility from organisation health and safety perspective when during working hours regardless if they are working from home i'm just wondering if liz or janine had a perspective of did you have to create these policies uh, what, what did this prompt a whole new raft of effort internally uh, to be compliant uh, with obviously ohs uh, policies and procedures of your orgs yeah i think um for us we had we had it there as a backup, but never with the intention that it would be used for this. Um, so we actually have, um, you know, a, a working offsite or a working from home, um, if you will, questionnaire that each of the staff members actually complete um, for us to be able to go, yes, they work in a safe, secure sort of environment. Um, we also have the option of, you know, if it's something that does need to be a ergonomic whatever um, that obviously they can they can put through the proposal or the request um, for that and it and it's still very much considered based you know just because they're not based in an office um, if it's still a requirement for them to be able to sustainably complete the tasks that we need them to it's absolutely something that we we've supported um, staff with everything from you know upgrading their home office chair for example um, however we've just been really clear about okay well if we if we invest in these sort of resources where does the ownership lie effectively yeah great thank you actually the next uh, question is actually for steve i can i can answer this one straight away um, so the data you collected, does that reflect Australia uh, or New Zealand businesses um, and where are those customers located? Um, are there many offshore or hybrid businesses uh, within the data you collated? Um, these particular um, survey respondents are all based on um, the affected mainlands. We, we obviously, if, if we have stuff that's offshore, it does tend to be skewed somewhat. So we, we just ask people, you know, do you have a physical location within Australia and New Zealand? Right. And just uh, following up, I'm trying to meld two questions into one on this one. Um, so these are mostly domestic based um, servicing uh, the same region as obviously they're operating at be it Australia and New Zealand or is, were, were there any international flavours or customers calling into these? call centres do you know of? Um, without having to go through the database, I, I can't be entirely sure, but um, I seem to remember that they were domestic, serving domestic customers. Predominantly pre domestic, that's great. Right, very much so, yeah. yeah. Now, forgive here, but... me, I will try and answer, we're, very, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to try and meld three questions into one here, so forgive me if I don't get this 100% right, but we'll try and get a theme. And I think really this again will be for Steve um, because um, we saw AI mentioned a few times, um, but I know in Australia and New Zealand, you know, there's a lot of thought about this, but no one's really done much. But I know the UK and US where you've done a lot of research around this in the past. Um, what does really AI mean? For the, for the market, for the contact centre community. Yeah, well, I'll just do a quick plug here. We have a report called the Inner Circle Guide to AI, available free on the website. So um, that will give you everything you need to know. But <laughs> the, the, well, you did ask. Um, 
Yeah, so what I would say is the, the first wave of AI, if you're like in, in heavy quotes here, is, is often through chatbots and some of them are more intelligent than others, um, but often it gets rolled into the same thing. So chatbots is what we've seen coming in first. And there's a lot of interest um, in America and the UK now about developing this to live agent assistants. So, you know, that's a you know a little supervisor or advisor on the desktop, um, giving agents things like next next best action, um, suggesting things that have worked in the past with similar types of customers working in the background to bring up um, you know, lots of information from lots of different applications and pop it all on a single pane of glass. And moving you know, a bit more into the future, the Star Trek idea is like kind of predictive analytics, um, what's worked with other customers and, and building on that and giving kind of proactive customer service. So kind of insights and actions almost before the customer knows that they even need it. So there's some pretty exciting stuff happening. But, you know, at the moment, you know, a lot of people are still focused on getting their chatbots up and working and with a bit more kind of intelligence. Well, thank you, Steve. And look, uh, sorry for going just slightly past our allotted time. Uh, that draws to a close. Thank you again for our presenters today. Um, it's been fantastic having you here and thanks for sharing your insights. Uh, that concludes this webinar. Thank you very much for all attending and please keep an eye out in your inbox for the recording in due course. Thank you very much. Goodbye.